<laughs> okay, good morning. Um, my name is Castellana de Andalusia. Um, I am, whoop, let's see, there we go. Um, I am the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Belonging Officer for the Kingdom of Ansteora. Um, I teach a variety of DEIB classes. Uh, I will also be teaching DEIB terms, part, terms and definitions part one and two later today. Um, my Facebook uh, information um, is Roxy J. Elliott, and I have both my um, office email and my personal email here, and I like to give a blanket consent. Um, anybody and everybody, you are welcome to contact me, um, email, Facebook Messenger, um, whatever works best for you. I am really positive about um, good communication. Um, so um, I like to start each of my classes with some community standards. Um, I like to say community standards rather than rules uh, because this is something we agree to uh, when we enter a class. And um, my community standards are, let's use I statements, um, let's actively listen, let's respect confidentiality, and let's honor boundaries. Um, I statements is simply active first person speaking. Um, that way we're focusing on ourselves as opposed to focusing on other people's behaviors. This makes it sound less accusatory, um, less confrontational. Um, there's a big difference between I don't feel heard and you're not listening to me. So I statements are, I think, I feel, I'm concerned, I want, I need. Um, active listening, I love this image. Um, there are seven steps to active listening. The one I like to point out the most is reflecting and paraphrasing. And if I say something, or if you're talking with anybody and they say something and you are unsure of their meaning, if their meaning is ambiguous or unclear, you can try to say it back to them in your own words. That way you can, um, you can clarify meaning and they can either agree or adjust their wording. And I think that's a great way to um, improve communication. Uh, confidentiality. Uh, basically what happens in class stays in class. Um, it is completely okay to leave this class and talk to your friends and colleagues and say, in this class, we talked about this. Um, but what respecting confidentiality is, is not leaving the class and saying, in this class, this specific person said this specific thing. And then boundaries. Um, dictionary definition is it's just a line. It's a limit. Um, a personal boundary are the lines and limits we set for ourselves. All right. What is inclusive language? We're going to be talking about, a lot about language. We're going to be covering um, some terms that have to do with uh, linguistic shift and the way terms change. Uh, we're also going to cover some specific exclusionary language that we can possibly catch in ourselves when we say it, and we can adjust and use more inclusive language. Um, inclusive language is the conscious decision to avoid bias, slangs, expressions that discriminate against groups of people based on physical ability, mental cognizance, race, gender, sexuality, socioeconomic status, culture, etc. cetera. Um, let me move this out of the way if I can. There we go having trouble seeing my own slides. Um, inclusive language is choosing language that includes rather than excludes. It is choosing language that acknowledges, accepts, and celebrates differences. Excuse me, differences. It's choosing language that is welcoming to everyone. Come on, there we go. Um, so some of the things that we try to avoid when talking about inclusive language are biases, and that's the tendency to believe that some people, ideas, or behaviors are considered default or normal. Um, you'll hear me say this again and again when we start talking about um, specific exclusionary language. Um, slang are types of languages that consist of words or phrases that are regarded as informal. Um, also, um, regarding particular context, 
groups of people, et cetera. Um, even in um, our society within the SEA, we have a lot of slang that we use. Um, and since this is a Chatelaine symposium, um, this is an important um, type of exclusionary language because our newcomers aren't going to understand our slang. Um, so when we use expressions that we think are default knowledge, we need to make sure to explain what those terms mean, explain what these expressions mean so that our newcomers um, are on the same page with us. Um, expressions, groups of words that establish established by a usage having a meaning not deducible from those of the individual words. This is kind of back with slang. And then discrimination is to make a distinction in favor of or against a person or group of people based on specific characteristics. Um, there are four main types of discrimination, direct, indirect, harassment, and victimization. When we talk about inclusive language, we're going to focus on indirect discrimination because most of the time, the expressions, the slang, the idioms that we're using, um, we're not conscious that we're being exclusionary. Um, these are things that we are used to saying. They're ingrained in us. Um, and so we tend to indirectly discriminate. Why is inclusive language important? It is empowering and affirming. It is more likely to encourage people to feel like they belong and that they can be their, their, their authentic, I cannot speak this morning, I apologize, their authentic selves within the SEA. Empowering simply is to give someone the authority or power to do something. And affirming is to give the big yes, or to confirm that something is true. And my addendum to the definition of affirming is to confirm that something is acknowledged, accepted, and celebrated as true. It is one thing to use language that is um, simply, simply denotes acknowledging or accepting something, but we can acknowledge or accept something without celebrating it. And I think that celebration is the most important part of inclusive language. Um, things to keep in mind. Uh, there we go. Um, acknowledge diversity of individuals within our community without value judgment or through the lens of normal, abnormal, typical, atypical, etc. A value judgment is an assessment of something as good or bad in terms of one's standards or priorities. Don't make assumptions about someone's identity. And inclusive language takes work. It asks something of us. It asks us to try and change deeply embedded habits, to consider the implications of our words and phrases, and to dig deep into empathy and imagine experiences not our own. And this is hard. Um, it's hard for me. I believe it's hard for everyone. Language is something that is unconscious. Most of the time we talk without thinking and inclusive language, using inclusive language takes, it requires the work to actually listen to what we're saying and acknowledge how what we say impacts other people. Um, and we have to approach inclusive language with a growth mindset. As we begin to update and correct some of our language, we will make some mistakes. It's human. But inclusive language is us actively trying to change how we learn and grow. And when we change, when we make that change in ourselves, we create change on a bigger context. We create change within our society as a whole. Um, and a growth mindset is the understanding that we can learn and unlearn. Oftentimes unlearning is more difficult. We adapt, change, grow, and heal. Yes, it's hard, but it's possible and it's absolutely worth it. So now we're gonna talk about the evolution of language. 
how language changes. Um, I think we all understand that language is fluid. Uh, some of the terms and expressions that we use today um, do not have the same meaning as they did five years ago, 10 years ago, 100 years ago. And we can assume that these same terms are going to have different meanings five years from now. So the first um, term we're gonna learn as far as um, language shift, linguistic shift, um, and that's semantic shift, and that's synonymous with um, language shift, linguistic shift. Um, and that is that language changes usually to the point that the modern meaning is radically different from the original use. And a great example, um, specifically in the SCA, is the word night. And it comes from the old English word, and I'm not going to be able to say this, but connect is my guess, uh, which, which meant boy or youth, servant or attendant, um, which obviously is drastically different than the way we use the word night today. So this is an example of semantic shift, where a word had a certain origin or a certain meaning, and it has come to mean something dramatically different. Um, amelioration and reclamation. Amelioration is a type of semantic change that ele <clears throat> excuse me, that elevates a word's meaning over time. It is a word that previously had a negative meaning and has now developed a positive one. Uh, sometimes this is referred to semantic melior melioration or semantic elevation. Um, and one of these types of amelioration is semantic reclamation. Um, or reappropriation. And that's when individuals in a group take ownership of a derogatory term that has previously been used to oppress them. Um, a great example is the use of the word queer, which was used as, which first simply meant um, strange or odd. It shifted to a derogatory term against the LGBTQ community, and now it has been reclaimed or reappropriated by that community. Um, the opposite is semantic perjuration, and that's when a word's meaning gains a more negative meaning over time. Perjuration is deliberately downgraded or a deprecation of a word's meaning a word with a positive sense taken and turned into a slur or insult. Um, my example for this has changed over time, but I think the best one to use now is the word woke. It originally, um, its meaning was originally positive. It was used to mean someone who is um, aware of the social injustices in the world. And now you will hear it used as an insult. Um, degrading people for, how do I want to word this? Um, used as an insult to mean um, too soft or um, usually too liberal in their mindset. So how do I know what word to use and when? And this is what makes inclusive language inclusive incredibly difficult. There is rarely a consensus on what terms to use. But inclusive language allows for self-identification. That's the most important um, aspect. That's the most important way to switch our brains into knowing what word to use and when. And self-identification is the act of understanding and describing your identity using terms that feel right to you. And this isn't about being politically correct or pandering or catering to a certain group of people. I have heard all of these before, unfortunately, um, but allowing for self-identification is about dignity, it's about compassion, and it's about decency. It is about grace, it is about courtliness, it is about chivalry. 
And this goes back to the SCA's um, core principles, um, the tenets of our game, and that is acting in accordance with the chivalric virtues of honor and service. It's about valuing and respecting the worth and dignity of all individuals. Mm -hmm. It's about actively practicing inclusiveness. It's about respecting pluralism and diversity. It's about promoting a safe and respectful environment for everyone. And it's about acting with transparency, fairness, integrity, and honesty. And those are taken verbatim from the SEA's core principles. It's about being human. We know how we like to be addressed. We know how we like to be spoken to. And we understand what words and expressions hurt us. So inclusive language is understanding that we like and dislike certain terms and expressions. And it's turning that around and being respectful of other people's likes and dislikes when it comes to terms and expressions and ways of being addressed. It's okay to not know. If you're not sure of something, ask. And it's perfectly acceptable to acknowledge that we don't have all the answers. We're all learning and unlearning. I'm still learning and unlearning. I don't know that anybody knows everything there is no, to know about inclusive language. So asking, asking individuals how they'd like to be addressed, asking groups of people what language and what terms are appropriate and not appropriate. And it's about asking ourselves what terms and expressions make us feel icky and being able to um, stand up for ourselves, to advocate for ourselves um, and to speak out and tell people that I'm not okay um, with that expression. I'm not okay being called that. Um, I cannot see the comments, but I'd like to stop here and ask if anyone has any questions up to this point. I don't see anything so far, Castiana. So uh, I think everything's going great and I'm loving what you're sharing. All right, then I will keep going. Thanks. Um, first thing we're going to talk about as far as specific inclusive and exclusive language is person first versus identity first language. Um, person first language puts the person before the diagnosis. And I use diagnosis here in quotes, um, any term used to um, explain or denote personal characteristics about an individual. Um, the thinking behind this is that a person is more than their diagnosis. Example, a person with autism. Identity first language views that a person's diagnosis as an is a part of their individual identity. And the thinking behind this is that a diagnosis is not inherently bad and is principal to the formation of a person's identity. Example, an autistic person. Here's the debate. Um, since, the, since first being introduced in the late 1980s, the generally accepted practice in the United States, at least, has been to use person-first language. Aligned with the social model of disability, person-first language was intended to shift the, the focus of the impairment to the social barriers that impede full participation in the community. The proponents of first person language advocate for conveying the humanity of a disabled person over the disability. However, big however, um, many self advocates, and for this example, particularly in the autism community, have expressed a preference for identity first language, such as autistic, autistic person, or autistic individual. Um, comparing the phrasing to the way we use other personal identifiers. Um, example, Muslim, tall, gay, athletic, etc. cetera. Um, 
as an alternative to person first language, some people in the disabled com disability community have lobbied for a wider adoption of identity first language, which is aligned with the minority model of disability, which asserts that a disability is a, is a diverse cultural experience and an essential identif identifier. It is impossible to affirm the value and worth of a disabled person without recognizing their identity as a disabled person. I am not here to tell you that one way is better than the other. I am not here to say you need to use this versus this. I am simply giving you all the information I can so that you can make um, an informed decision on what language to use. Um, I will tell you what I choose to use and that is identity first language. I will say autistic person. Um, I am autistic. I have an autistic son. Um, I will say I am autistic. I don't say I have autism because the entirety of my life, um, my growth, my um, the formation of me as a person had at its core my autism. And it is impossible to take that away from who I am. Um, I've seen a great image that has a stick figure with a suitcase and the suitcase is labeled autism. And it says, you know, a person with autism, like a person with this suitcase, there's no way for me to set that suitcase down and walk away. It is a part of who I am. So that is why I choose to use identity first language as opposed to person first language. Um, but again, I'm not here to say which one is right or wrong. Um, so we're shifting to more specifics of exclusive language. And that is language that is unintentionally or intentionally language that uses words to exclude an individual or a group. It often results in negativity and or alienation of certain individuals or groups. And that's why this class is so important um, for um, chatelains, hospitalers, because we are the ones that are directly interacting with our newcomers. And obviously, if we are using language that um, is negative or alienates individuals or groups, we are going to lose that possible recruitment. Um, I'm gonna start with gender and I'm going to go through um, certain demographics and talk about specifics, um, specific terms that could be exclusionary and some terms that we could use instead. Um, so under gender, language that implies that gender is a binary. Um, examples, my lords or ladies, or even a singular, my lord or my lady. Um, a great um, alternative is gentles. Um, in our court settings, um, instead of, you know, my lords and ladies, pray attend, simply good gentles all, pray attend. Um, opposite sex, if we use the word opposite, then we're denoting a binary. Um, so instead of opposite sex, different sex, um, moms and dads, um, parents or guardians. And then the use of pronouns, his, her, he, she, they're, they. Um, any language that directly or indirectly equates genitor, gender to genitalia. And this example, I hear it all the time and it bothers me every time. And that is a female or male adapter to a female or male connector. Why we identify inanimate objects with genitalia um, seems odd and slightly inappropriate. Um, and then language that makes assumptions on or about someone's gender. If we're talking um, about the future, the future kings and queens, future monarchs, 
or the next baron and baroness, the next baronage. Um, I just discovered the word baronage and it has very quickly become one of my favorite words. Um, language that denotes implied choice. Sexual preference, we can simply say one's sexuality. Preferred pronouns, simply a person's pronouns. Or a person's lifestyle versus simply their life. Um, language that um, promotes or instills the heteronormative and the he definition heteronormative is the concept that heterosexuality is the default or normal. It enforces the gender binary and that sexual relations are natural only between members of, and in quotes, the opposite sex. Um, the heteronormative creates and upholds a social hierarchy based on sexual orientation with the practice and belief that heterosexuality is deemed the social norm and anything else is deviancy. A heteronormative view therefore involves alignment of biological sex, sexuality, gender identity, and gender roles. That was a mouthful. Are there any questions about this? Okay. Um, exclusive language about race and or ethnicity. Um, ethnocentric language is evaluating other people and cultures according to the standards of one's own culture. And we can only see the world through the lenses of our own lives. And that's perfectly understandable. That's, we have to start somewhere and that's the only place we can start is with our own lived experiences. But when we start to think of our lived experiences as the default and everyone else's lived experiences are othered or abnormal or atypical, that's when ethnocentric um, ethnocentricity um, becomes a negative. Um, um, one, one example of ethnocentric language that I hear a lot is more exotic personas when we simply mean non-European personas. Um, and then expressions using color to denote rightness or wrongness, blackball, black marked, blacklisted versus whitelisted, or the black sheep. These terms weren't originally necessarily about race, but when we start to use colors, specifically black and white, to denote rightness and wrongness, it starts to alienate people of color and alienation is the opposite of what we're trying to do um, when we actively use inclusive language. So try to trying to stay away from language that uses color um, to denote rightness or wrongness. Um, expressions with racist history. And obviously there is a novel's worth of expressions. Um, I just grabbed a few. For examples um, for this class, um, ghetto, um, meaning a part of a city which members of a particular group or light race live usually in poor conditions. Um, and we tend to use the word ghetto, meaning anything that's not up to our personal standards. Um, and it's understandable why using these words could be exclusive. Exclusion, exclusionary language. Um, grandfathered in or the grandfather clause, um, which was associated with laws enacted by some US states to prevent the black communities from voting after the first, the 15th amendment. <clears throat> Gypped, um, and this is the only time you will hear me use this word, um, short for gypsy, um, which is typically used to describe the Romani people. And this term carries a negative connotation as it's 
definition is to defraud, swindle, or cheat someone. Um, no can do. The phrase is derived from a pidgin English in the 19th century, where Americans um, used it to mock uh, Chinese immigrants. Peanut gallery is first documented use was to refer to the section of theater, um, which was um, reserved for black people when uh, theater seating was segregated. Um, spirit, animal, powwow, war paint, tribe, um, these kinds of expression, um, given the history and current uh, oppression of indigenous communities, this casual appropriation of language can be painfully insultive uh, to indigenous communities. Um, that was just a small selection. There are quite a few, and even that's an understatement of expressions that are part of our everyday language um, that have racist history, have racist history. Um, disability. Um, ableism is discrimination of and social prejudice against people with disabilities based on the belief that typical um, that typical abilities are superior. And I just caught um, a personal use of person first language instead of identity first language. Um, I do have people with disabilities uh, typed there under ableism instead of um, disabled people. Um, so for me personally, I will probably want to go back and correct my wording of this slide, um, but I wanted to point that out because I just caught it. Um, and ableism can show up in language directly as well as in metaphors and euph euphemisms. Listen closely, all rise, feast your eyes upon, and as you walked by. Um, we think of these expressions as innocent or benign, but each of them do have um, ableist metaphors and euph euphemisms in there. So instead of listen closely, um, pay attention. Uh, all rise could also be, you know, um, pray heed um, or pay attention. Feast your eyes upon. Um, hmm, trying to think of a good a, a good change for that one. Um, appreciate might be an option for that. And then as you walked by, as you passed by. Um, Mental health, recognizing the impact of mental health language, um, specific diagnosis, bipolar, PTSD, OCD, ADHD. These are real mental health diagnoses and using these terms to describe everyday behavior underplays the impacts of, impact of someone's experiences with mental disorders. Um, and I'm sure we've all heard or even used some of these. Uh, the weather is being so bipolar, uh, using words like crazy, insane, psycho, or schizo to mean erratic behavior. Um, the use of the words suicidal, manic, hysterical um, in regards to personal everyday things, um, anxiety or panic, split personality, and trigger. These are all words that I have heard and even used in the past um, to refer to something that has nothing to do with a person's lived experiences with mental disorders. Um, because when you treat a disability as a joke, metaphor, or euphemism, you are spreading the idea that is it that it is acceptable to dehumanize and stigmatize someone with a disability. Um, I did it again using um, person first instead of identity first. This is how I learn. I learn by calling myself out um, when I hear myself say something or see myself uh, see an example of it in my slides. Um, so when you hear me call myself out, that is the way I have learned to unlearn um, this problematic language. Um, 
And depending on your circle or friend group, you could even be enabling others to do the same. Um, trigger warnings. Um, <clears throat> triggered is one of those words. One, it has an association with a real um, mental health diagnosis. Um, two, it is also an example of semantic perjuration. Um, you will hear people insultively, insultingly say, oh, did you get triggered by that? So trigger is an example of two of the things that we have discussed. Um, but I do want to cover trigger warnings in this class um, because there is a current debate on whether or not trigger warnings should be used in the SCA. I personally advocate for them, and this is why. Um, trigger warnings are a statement at the start of a piece of writing, video, et cetera. This could be um, in, um, at the start of a bardic piece, at the start of court, um, any number of um, examples in the SEA. And they alert the reader or viewer to the fact that this might contain potentially distressing material. Um, common trigger warnings include, but are certainly not limited to, sexual assault, abuse, child abuse, animal cruelty, self-harm, eating disorders or body hatred, kidnapping and abduction, death, miscarriage or abortion, blood, mental illness and ableism, racism or racial slurs, sexism, misogyny, and classism. Obviously, this is not um, a complete list. Um, and the reason I advocate for trigger warnings, I don't expect people to tiptoe around my triggers. But what I would like is all the information that can be given to me so that I can make the best decision for me on whether or not I should leave or I should stay. Um, and I think that that's what's important for most people. Uh, we all have a history. We all have things in our past that cause us to flash back or that cause us to feel uncomfortable, unsafe. And if we all start to include trigger warnings, then we are allowing people um, to make the best to, the, to make the best decision for themselves. Um, and really, that's the best thing we can do in all circumstances, in all situations, is allowing people. It's giving people the information to make informed decisions. Um, that is the end of my slide, um, the end of my class.